So it's this morning's this morning's time in the Word is is a little bit abbreviated because of this, and I and we usually do this in, on Sunday evenings. I like it better on Sunday mornings because you all get to participate now. So the the, the word this morning is is geared toward toward a challenge for those people up here who just completed training, and for you who have been through training. There's three groups. And the third group is all the rest of you who are believers who should be trained, but even if you're not, you should trust the Word of God as you come alongside your brothers and sisters. And so we're, I'm going to be all over the place, but if you want to turn to Scripture, Romans 15, 4 to 6 is where we're going to begin. Romans 15, 4 to 6. Some of you have heard this story before, but I have a granddaughter who a few, I have many, two, three granddaughters. One of them a few years ago became ill. Nothing really serious, but her mother called me and said, I'm not sure what to do, whether I should take her to the ER or not. Now, her mother is a seasoned pediatric emergency nurse. In fact, she's a certified emergency pediatric nurse. And in her home is this little girl, and her statement is, I don't know whether to take her to the ER or not. I'm not here, and here's the, 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 the end of the sentence. I'm not wet, sure whether to use my mommy brain or my nurse brain. I'm not sure whether to use my mommy brain or my nurse brain. So what was she saying? Well, my mommy brain is filled with emotion and love and compassion. My nurse brain is filled with compassion, but better understands the symptoms of what's going on with my daughter. And so in her mind, there's a conflict because mommy brain, you, you who have been mommies or are mommies, get this idea, especially with maybe a first child, everything is critical. Everything, my child usually sleeps for four hours a night and it's been four hours and 10 minutes and she's still sleeping. What's wrong? But the nurse knows there's nothing wrong. Your child is just tired and your child is growing up and your child will sleep longer and longer. The facts in this case with my granddaughter were constant and they were sure. It was the perception and the reaction to those facts that was in question, that was variable. Was one brain better than the other? If so, which one? And there's a similar challenge that we have in the church as believers as we come alongside our brothers and sisters who are suffering. Whether they're suffering at the hands of others or they're suffering because they made a poor decision or there's just sin We've got these two brains. We're tempted to use an emotional, loving, compassionate brain that just comes alongside and, and just, just let me give you a hug and let me sit with you. And this is really good. This is a good brain to have. But we need to be careful to, with all that, include a biblically informed brain because all around us, there are competing voices to the Word of God. When I was, uh, I had just, I'd been a youth pastor for almost 20 years, and I'd been demoted to an associate pastor position, because I just thought that was the greatest job. Why would anybody ever leave that? And one of the girls in the youth group was 16 years old on New Year's Eve, was in a car accident, and she was killed. And 
as devastating as that was, almost just as bad was the youth pastor who went to the funeral home and picked up a bunch of secular brochures on grief and passed them out to all the kids rather than sitting down and meeting with them and caring for them. Because those resources are there and sometimes we don't think and sometimes we're just not sure what to do. Is the Bible sufficient for that? Romans 15, verses 4 to 6, we read, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Biblical counseling recognizes and affirms the claims of Scripture in its promises and its precepts, in its principles, in its wisdom, to be all sufficient for all matters of life and godliness that the believer has. The heart, the heart from which our responses and our affections come is addressed in Scripture. It's there. And it's addressed in the Scriptures in a way that a believer may know how to obey and glorify God regardless of the situations of life. I'm not going to take time to give you my testimony. I'm not going to give you, take time to give you my testimony in biblical counseling in my life either. Suffice it to say that I look around this room and I know many of you, and I weep for you, with you, because so many in this room have gone through such devastating things in their life. And I weep with you, but I also rejoice with you if you will believe that the word of God is sufficient to get you through that, to transform you in that, to change you in that. I was fortunate yesterday, I played in a golf outing. The three guys with me were not so fortunate. I hurt my back last week and I thought it was better until the second hole. And I realized as I bent over to put the tee in the ground in the third hole, I couldn't reach the ground. So I pushed the ball onto the tee. It was was a long day for me and these guys are driving around and they're picking up my balls and they're teeing the ball up for me. And it was horrible. But but in in the midst of horrible, We were on one of the most beautiful golf courses in the area. It's a family-owned golf course in Tip City, and and there were were flowers on almost every hole, and and the the day was beautiful. The sun came out. There was a little waterfall halfway through. It was a beautiful place. And you could just, through the midst of that, Just see what a beautiful creation is all around us. Everything God made is designed to confront us with that. His existence and his nature. And in doing so, we come face to face with the delusions of our autonomy and our self-reliance. Every morning we get up, we bump into God. Every morning we get up, we are face to face with the Creator. He is revealed in the wind and in the rain, and in the birds and in the flowers, in the rocks and the trees, in the sun and the moon and the grass and the clouds and the sights and the smells and the things and things we hear. He's all around us. We see it. I sit in my church office and I look out my window at what Linus has done. 
and I have to shut my blinds because people come in and sit for counseling and they can't focus because they're staring out the window of the beauty that sits outside of that mulch, the wildflowers and the whatever, I don't know what they are. So I have to shut the blinds. It's all around us. We see it. We look out here and, in, and we, we hear it's full, I'm dating myself, it's surround sound and technicolor every place we look of what God has done. The things we taste, everything is a finger pointing to the existence of God. Last week, the thunder clouds came in, the storm clouds came in. The, the, it, was, it was pouring down rain. There's nothing better than to be in this room in a rainstorm. It is nothing short of awesome to hear the thunder and the, and, and the rain hitting this metal roof. It's an amazing thing. And it's the message of the physical world that is so all-encompassing and it's so all-clear that Romans 1 says, we as human beings have to fight to suppress it. We suppress it. But God in his infinite wisdom knew that the general revelation of creation, which, which confronts us with his existence and his glory, could not impart to us the knowledge of him that we need to know him, for salvation, and to know ourselves. We can't understand the meaning and purpose of life by looking out my office window. We cannot understand the depth of our neediness by sitting on a golf course and looking at a waterfall with wildflowers. And so he gave us the wonderful an amazing gift that we call the Bible, the Word of God. This fall, not the fall, this fall, we're going to start a series on Sunday nights in Proverbs. Proverbs is a book about wisdom and foolishness. And one of the devastating results of sin is that it reduces us all to fools. A fool looks at truth and sees falsehood. A fool looks at bad and sees good. A fool looks at good and sees bad. A fool ignores God and inserts himself into the position of God. A fool rebels against God's wise and loving word and writes his own moral code. A fool thinks he can live independently and with no need of help. A fool will not think as he is designed to think, desire as he was created to desire, or do what he has been called to do. And the most deadly part about being a fool is a fool has no idea that he is a fool. So God, in the beauty of his grace, did not turn his back on our foolishness. He did not walk away from us. God gave us this gift of his word so that fools would not only recognize their foolishness, but have the way of being transformed out of it. And the way that we understand everything in life is shaped by this body of wisdom that takes place between the first chapter of Genesis. I'm going backwards. I've got to go this way for you, don't I? The first chapter of Genesis to the last chapter of Revelation. If you're old enough, you remember the spaghetti commercials for Prego, spaghetti sauce. Does anybody remember the tagline for Prego? It's in there. It's all in there. It's the word of God. It's all in there. They would pour ragu of the strainer, it runs through the strainer, and they'd pour, pour uh, what did I say, R- ragu. they pour Prego, and the other strainer would just sit there because it's all in there. Right? All the spices are in there. Everything's in there. You don't need to add anything else like you have to do with other spaghetti sauces. This is the Word of God. 
And so the challenge to all of us who come alongside others to help in times of trouble is, is the word really sufficient? And that question in and of itself isn't sufficient. You can't have a fruitful discussion based on that sentence, based on that question. Is the Bible truthful? Is it reliable? For what is the scripture sufficient? Do I buy a red car or a blue car? Do I buy a car with four tires or three tires? Or do I buy a vehicle with two tires? How does the Bible inform us of that? Now, it doesn't, it does, it's not about that. It's not about how much medicine to give my child. It is sufficient and complete enough, however, to answer the question of life's most difficult temptations and problems. But we are tempted to look for extra biblical things. We are tempted to go to, your rest, was it two weeks ago, referenced a Christian bookstore. He said, if you go to a Christian bookstore, if you can find one, look at the self-help book section. That's where we go. When you come to my office, I have hundreds of books. If you really want to see a good book collection, go to Greg Cook's house and look in his middle bedroom. Chad Bresson had so many books that he had them double stacked on his shelf. He had to move an entire section of books to see the ones behind it. Of the writing of many books, there is no end, the Bible says. But he goes on to say, that's not the point. So we look to these things. Paul talks about this. I think Jason is going to preach on this in a couple weeks. Colossians 2? No? 4? No. Oh. All right. Somebody's going to preach in Colossians 2 in two weeks. It's not me. I got the second part. Is it you? Do you have, chapter, do you have verse 8? Okay. So here's what, he, here's what Tim Rex is going to preach about in two weeks. Try to give you a heads up. You know, this is, if you read ahead of time, you'll get more out of the sermon. So, so you sh- that's why we publish it in the Chapel Weekly every week so you know what we're going to preach so you can look at it. And if you don't know what the Chapel Weekly is, go to the welcome desk and tell them, I want the Chapel Weekly. See to it, Paul says to the Colossians, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And the culture around us, is, it, there's competing voices all the time for that. It is pervasive and it's persuasive. It is pervasive in that it is in the air we breathe. Every school you go to, even Christian schools, will have these philosophies. You see it on television. You read it in the newspaper. You see it in magazines. It's everywhere. Myths like self-esteem have overtaken us. I have a school teacher friend who a few years ago went to a required seminar somewhere, and the whole thing was on self-esteem and why it's so important for our children to have good self-esteem. You know what the Bible calls self-esteem? Self-worship. You know, in, the, in our church, in about an hour, there will be a group of people, of, there will be a group of unbelievers, and they will meet together. They'll all be in the same couple rooms, and they'll be easy, easily identified, because they'll be in that end of the building in, in three rooms, and there are children. Well, they'll be in five rooms, because they've got nursery, too. You know, you can, we, can, we can group together the people in the United States with the highest self-esteem. They're in the same rooms too. We call them penitentiaries because they're too smart to get caught. But these are the things that enter into our minds everywhere we go. And they're persuasive and that they're, they're argued from stories that sound, sounds good, it sounds true, sounds like it makes sense. Pastor Russ talked about this, I think, the second or third week in Colossians. There's, they, they ring true. And we fall, we fall prey as believers to the truism 
that the person with the facts is always at the mercy of the person with the experience. Let me read, let me, let me say that to you again. We fall prey to the truism that the person with the facts is always at the mercy of the person with the experience. Truth isn't enough. It's experience that matters. David Wells writes, truth is now simply a matter of etiquette. It has no authority. It has no sense of rightness because it is no longer anchored in anything absolute. If it persuades, it does so only because our experience has given it persuasive power. But tomorrow, our experience may be different. Barna did research many years ago, and he, they researched adults and teenagers, and they found that over 60% of adults believed that truth was relative to experience, and over 80% of teenagers believed that truth was not absolute. Only 6% of teenagers in the United States believed that truth was absolute. The scriptures are emphatic about the dangers of human devised wisdoms and worldviews and techniques. And the scripture places those against the stunning wisdom of God, the stunning truth of the word of God. It is all-encompassing. God's gaze is all-encompassing. This stuff that we fall into, that we believe, is, is, is wood, hay, and stubble compared to the word of God and the truth of God's word. The bedrock upon which our lives as Christians sit is the word of God, specifically the written word of God. God has given us the Bible so that we may know him and, that we may, and so we may understand us. Therefore, the supreme source of Christian truth is the scriptures. We see this in 2 Peter verse 1, this idea that, that everything we need for life and godliness, God has given us in the knowledge of him, in his precious and great promises. And they have helped us escape from the corruption of the world. It's 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. The, the scripture is sufficient to teach me everything I need to know about salvation and everything that pertains to the Christian faith. And it's not only sufficient, it stands alone. If Christ's ministry on the cross for you is sufficient for salvation, how can the word of God not be sufficient for everything else he asks you and expects you of you? And, and men and women, we must acknowledge that the scriptures set the agenda of our focus. God's interpretation of reality is the true interpretation. Since God's interpretation of life is true, we must reject our human experiences in interpreting life. And if we have to re reject human experiences that, that does not, I don't want to say the word jive, if we're looking through the lens of Scripture at human experience, and if we have to reject those that disagree, then we have to reject everything else in life that's based on those human experiences. With God's Word as the framework for our counseling, how do we, how do we introduce this or apply this sufficiency to the lives of those that we're trying to help? When we are introduced to couples whose marriages are shambles, people with addictive behaviors that have ruined their lives, men and women involved in pornography, adulterers, those with chronic anger, and many who are suffering at the hands of others. How does God's word prove sufficient for the sin and suffering for their lives? Turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. If you don't have this memorized. I think if you ever went through Awana, you should have this memorized. You probably have it memorized in a different version than I'm 
going to look at. But all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What a great and wonderful promise for the counselor. What a great and wonderful promise for the person being counseled. The scripture is breathed out by God. It is true. God doesn't lie. If the scripture is inspired, it must be inerrant because God doesn't make mistakes. The scripture teaches us not just doctrine, but about life itself. It teaches believers God's truth. The scripture rebukes as necessary. It reproves us when we have become out of step with God. That's the word. It's a military term where someone is marching and has become out of step. So we bring the scriptures to bear on the sin in the life of the counselee, the Holy Spirit gets involved and it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. The scriptures correct us as setting us straight. So reproof gets us back in step and correction puts us on the right path moving forward. The scripture trains us in righteousness. Literally, child training is the, is the idea. Guiding believers in God's way so that we would be complete and we would be equipped. For example, the Psalms help us not only remember God is, no long, is no, not a stranger to brokenness, but that his word ministers to those who are downcast. We read the lament Psalms and we see this in the psalmist. God, where are you? Everybody is out to get me. My enemies are coming after me. The swords are out. The arrows are out. I'm pleading to you. Where are you? Have you forsaken me? Ah, uh, no. Because I remember, God, that you have always been faithful. That you have always cared for me. That you have always been with me. And because God's word is sufficient for these things, our counselors and you, what do you can't forget? Everybody's a counselor. Let's just, so when I use the word counselor, everybody's a counselor. If, some, if you have coffee with somebody and you're talking about something, somebody's counseling. You're just, everybody's talking. We're, 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 it's iron sharpening iron. We're all counseling, some more formally than others. Yes, yeah, some have some training and addictions. I have all three of the specializations. And, and th does that mean I'm an expert? No, it means I get a little more training than somebody else. And I've got a little more experience with some, than somebody else. But we're all counseling. Because God's word is sufficient, we can approach the one suffering with gratitude and with gratefulness to God because God's grace has given us a settled hope that we are doing the right thing. Because it is not my opinion and it's not my specialization and it's not my training, and it's not my degree. I've got the living, powerful Word of God. The rest of it is secondary. I'll give you a, a Paul Tripp book to read maybe as a resource, but that's not, the, that's not the basis of our counsel. That's Paul Tripp's opinion. I mean, anybody with a mustache like that, you, you got a question. Something... Psalm 119 focuses us on the affection, the, the attention of God's word. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Counseling, we have to establish the authority of the scripture for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. One author writes, we speak not the counsel of men, but rather the counsel of God. This eliminates subjective thought. This eliminates any perception of our arrogance. In counseling, we must establish the adequacy of God's word. We affirm that numerous disciplines and professions can contribute. Yet scripture clarifies our standpoint and our gaze. 
If we are not careful in this area, it is easy for us to become functional atheists and we will begin to counsel from the world and experience and not from the word. He goes on, the strategies we implement in the care and cure of souls are shaped and selected by where we place our trust and reliance, whether in the techniques of human wisdom or in the word and power of God. Newly trained counselors, our ministry may be misunderstood. As we become skilled at understanding God's word and people and their life situations, our ability to help people in wisdom will increase. But so will our vulnerability to being misunderstood as merely operating in the realm of human wisdom and techniques in the flesh. And so our commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture in counseling stands out in contrast to both the world's way and the way of many Christians. Close this morning with Psalm 119, verses 7 to 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the heart. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Father, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for the sufficiency of it. We're so thankful that you have given it to us. We're grateful to be worshiping in a, with a group of people in a, in a congregation that places such great value on the word of God, the testimony of our Lord Jesus. Pray that we would remain faithful and our fidelity to the word would be pure. And I ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.